The most basic writing advice writers ever receive is write what you know. But why is that so important? Behind all believable fiction, there is some true experience that the writer drew from their own emotions and thoughts. Master fiction writers take their own experiences and interweave them into their work. Tolkien was no exception. Tolkien's interesting, full life inspired his epic novels. From culture, experiences, relationships, and memories, Tolkien's life was weaved into the words of his epic fantasy, The Lord of the Rings. To understand the depth of the novels, we must peek into the mind and past of the great J.R.R. Tolkien. I'm Vanessa K. Eccles, and this is Fabled. The afternoon drew long, and the tea wasn't strong enough. With a stack of papers on my desk, I leaned into the leather chair with my pen in hand and began to read through the student's work. Hours passed, but I pressed on. I needed to complete the task. Something, a story, had been nibbling at the outer edges of my mind, and I desperately wanted to explore it, even though I hadn't the faintest idea of what it was yet. I circled and scribbled notes in the margins until my eyes grew tired. I went to the window, lattice work lacing the pane, and opened it. A gust of wind hit my cheeks, and I closed my eyes. When I opened them, I watched as the evening sun glinted its dusty orange color on the grassy courtyard below. The students looked tiny from this height, little souls on a journey, heading towards something unknown, but at a rapid pace. Sipping the last of my tea, long since turned cold, I grabbed a few more papers, until suddenly I turned over and saw that one student had left a page blank. An opportunity. A mercy. A grace. Before I could process what I was doing, my pen took on a life of its own and wrote, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And so the adventure began. Tolkien's life and story began in Africa in 1892, near the end of the Victorian period. His writing was greatly affected by post-Victorian thoughts. Victorian poets like Emily Bronte, Christina Rossetti, and Alfred Lord Tennyson centered their poetry around morality and teaching it to society. Tolkien grew up favoring a new approach to literature, formalist. Formalist critics, according to Kenneth Brooks, believe, quote, that literature is not a surrogate for religion. Tolkien would have agreed. He did not think that morality needed to be taught in literature. He specifically did not want his work to be allegorical. He said, quote, As for any inner meaning or message, it has, in the intention of the author, none. It is neither allegorical or topical. Literature was art for art's sake. Understanding that a story is just a story is important when analyzing Tolkien's work. To properly analyze his work, we will study the life that inspired the writing. Tolkien's father died when he was very young, but it's his mother's death that greatly affected him and may have lent some inspiration to his future work on The Lord of the Rings. Mabel, his mother, died when he was only twelve. Mabel developed diabetes and, quote, while the disease involves a genetic disposition, 
research indicates an environmental trigger. She and her sons were estranged from their family because of her devout belief in Catholicism. Tolkien would always vow that the isolation that she felt and the added stress to her already dire situation triggered her diabetes and eventual death. In a letter to Tolkien's son, Michael, he writes, quote, She was a gifted lady of great beauty and wit, greatly stricken by God and grief and suffering, who died in youth of a disease hastened by persecution for her faith, died in a postman's cottage at Rednell, and is buried at Brahms Grove. The loss of his mother carved a deep scar on his heart, she was the first true model of womanhood in his life, and she would have greatly affected how he viewed women and how he portrayed them in his work. Understanding her motherly influence and in perceived martyrdom is important in comprehending Tolkien's view of women. Tolkien associated the English countryside with his departed mother, and this greatly contributed to his love for nature. Throughout the books, there is an apparent good in nature. Treebeard, the great ant, says in The Two Towers, quote, The woods were like the woods of Lothlorien, only thicker, stronger, and younger. And the smell of the air, I used to spend a week just breathing. The sense of peace that Tolkien feels when surrounded by nature is apparent in his words. When Treebeard first encounters Mary and Pippin, he says, quote, And I am doing the asking. You are in my country. This indicates Tolkien's respect for nature. He is making a strong environmental argument through the Ents. Later, the Ents become pivotal in winning the battle over darkness. Tolkien's love of nature evolved from his fond memories of his mother and reveals itself beautifully through the peaceful relationship between the hobbits and the ants. And this knowledge helps nature play a more pivotal part in the readers' minds while reading the novels. Tolkien's mother left her two sons to her priest, Father Morgan and Tolkien and Father Morgan developed a strong relationship over the years. Horn says, quote, Tolkien was also truly respectful and loyal to him. Their relationship mimics Bilbo and Frodo's. Bilbo was the overseer or guardian of Frodo, just as Father Morgan was to the orphaned Tolkien. Father Morgan was the only father that Tolkien could remember, and his respect for him is similar to what a son has for a father. Father Morgan pushed Tolkien to continue his education and rid himself of distractions. He believed in Tolkien's talent and helped him pursue an educational route that would both encourage and equip Tolkien's dreams and interests. Without the fatherly tug that Father Morgan provided, Tolkien's scholarly and creative pursuits may have been very different. The same goes for Frodo and Bilbo. If Bilbo had not raised Frodo with moral strength and integrity, Frodo may have never been able to save everyone from darkness. His weaknesses could have easily steered him in a different direction if it were not for the youthful guidance of his guardian, Bilbo. The love and respect that Bilbo and Frodo have for one another is apparent at their reunion at Rivendell. Bilbo's excitement is obvious when he says, quote, Hello, Frodo, my lad. So you have got here at last. I hoped you would manage it. Tolkien used his own relationship with Father Morgan to create the bond between Frodo and Bilbo, which offers additional insight to their relationships in the novel. Other bonds in the books may have been inspired by the relationships Tolkien developed while attending the various clubs he was a part of during his school years and later life. Tolkien was made librarian his senior year, 
and he and his friend Christopher Wiseman started the informal Tea Club and Barovian Society, or TCBS, at King Edwards College. According to Mark Horn, the group of men, quote, inspired one another to pursue their various interests. Clubs were very important in Tolkien's life. He thrived in an atmosphere of motivated, talented friends. He later became a part of the Inklings, along with C.S. Lewis. He even dedicated the Lord of the Rings to its members. These clubs are reminiscent of the pre-Raphaelite society in the Victorian era. The writers of the pre-Raphaelite movement wanted the same thing that the groups that Tolkien was involved in wanted, to write something original and worth remembering. According to Horn, quote, the TCBS moral vision was to invite the world to a meal instead of preaching at them. Tolkien needed the push, the encouragement, and inspiration of fellow writers and friends to complete his masterpieces, and sympathizing with his great struggle can offer new appreciation for his works of art. TCBS members kept Tolkien inspired and in pursuit of his dreams, even in World War I. The men kept in contact with one another via letters during their stint of the war. Horn quotes a letter written in the early part of the war to Tolkien by member G.B. Smith. Quote, He wanted Tolkien to be confident that, though death could destroy individuals, death could not dissolve the group. His chief consolation, knowing that he might die, was that there would be someone else to survive, to voice what I dreamed and what we agreed upon. He prayed God's blessings on Tolkien if he should be the one to survive and say the things I have tried to say long after I am not there to say them. Tolkien lost his friend Smith shortly after receiving this letter. After the war had ended, all of the TCBS members had died, with the exception of Tolkien and Christopher Wiseman, but their creative spirits were still alive in the mind of Tolkien. The ring in The Lord of the Rings, in some ways, acts as a symbol of the burden that Tolkien must have felt after realizing that it was left to him to write something that would preserve the memory and ideas of his fallen friends, to say the things they never had a chance to say, and to write the stories they never had a chance to write. Their permanent memory was written on his heart and helped Tolkien find the path that led straight to his destiny. In being exposed to his wartime past, we can see that the ring is more of a layered symbol than if we had not known. Fellowship and brotherhood is a reoccurring theme throughout The Lord of the Rings and throughout Tolkien's own life. As mentioned earlier, intellectual clubs were pivotal in Tolkien's pursuit of writing, but so too was his experience in World War I. He experienced friendship throughout wartime, and these memories of war could have made a significant influence over his writing. In the Fellowship of the Ring, before Frodo and his friends approach Farmer Maggot's place, they hear a call or signal. The narrator says, No more was said about it. They were all thinking of the writers, but no one spoke of them. They were now reluctant either to say or to go on, but sooner or later, they had to get across the open country to the ferry, and it was best to go sooner in the daylight. In a few moments, they had shouldered their packs, and again, were off. The fear and imminent feeling of danger is what Tolkien would have undoubtedly experienced during his stint of war. He made many friends, and it would be safe to assume that they would have experienced fear together. The Fellowship of the Ring could have been Tolkien's way of re-expressing the importance of his friendship with others during pivotal stages in his life, which would greatly affect readers' ideas of the Fellowship. 
Because of Tolkien's strong bonds of fellowship, leaving World War I was bittersweet. In Return of the King, Frodo bids adieu to all of his brothers in arms. The duty had been done, and their journey was over. When the hobbits were nearing Hobbiton, Mary says, quote, Well, here we are, just the four of us that started out together. We have left all the rest behind, one after another. It seems almost like a dream that has slowly faded. Saying goodbye was hard for everyone in the books, but no doubt was it even more so difficult for Tolkien to say farewell to his friends, especially the ones who had passed. Perhaps when Frodo leaves Sam, audiences get a clearer picture of the despair Tolkien would have felt at the death of his friends. The narrator says, But to Sam, the evening deepened to darkness as he stood at the haven. And as he looked at the gray sea, he saw only a shadow on the waters that was soon lost in the west. There still he stood far into the night, hearing only the sigh and murmurs of the waves on the shores of Middle-earth. And the sound of them sank deep into his heart. When Sam returned home to Eleanor and Rose, he was no doubt saddened by his loss of Frodo. Tolkien used his true emotional loss of friends in order to write believable and touching goodbye scenes that are even more endearing to us after learning about his personal losses. Many critics have complained about the heightened sense of brotherly love and the lack of true emotional romance in the books, but Tolkien's tales did not end nor begin with The Lord of the Rings. Tolkien himself lived a romantic story. He met his future wife, Edith, when he was only a teen, and she was three years his senior. Their love quickly blossomed, and all was well until Tolkien started doing poorly in school, and Father Morgan found out about Edith. Father Morgan blamed their romance for Tolkien's poor academic status and banned him from seeing Edith again. Father Morgan told Tolkien that he wasn't to have any contact with her until he turned 21 years old. For three years, Tolkien did not see Edith nor talk to her with the exception of one letter. He did as Father Morgan requested and focused on his studies. He excelled, but the day of his 21st birthday, he wrote Edith and asked her to marry him. He couldn't wait for a response, so he traveled to the town that she lived in and pleaded for her hand in person. She was already engaged to someone else, but her heart must have always belonged to Tolkien because she soon broke off her engagement and agreed to Tolkien's proposal. Tolkien, being a devout Catholic, insisted on her immediate conversion. She reluctantly did so but she struggled her entire life with fitting into a faith she never felt was her own. Tolkien realized that she had given up a lot marrying him, and this lent to the inspiration of Arwen and Aragorn, and earlier the hobbits Baron and Luthien. Tolkien said in a letter to his son after Edith's death, quote, Luthien, which says for me more than a multitude of words, for she was and knew she was, my Luthien. She was the source of the story that in time became the chief pan of the Silmarian. Tolkien even had the name Luthien placed at the bottom of Edith's tombstone and the name Baron placed at the bottom of his. Tolkien did not feel the need to write the love story that he lived. He felt the need to write the friendships that he lost. Understanding the need Tolkien had in restoring, even in fiction, what he lost, helps us grasp why he chose not to write very much about romance. Writers see the importance in passing along stories in hopes that they will never be lost, and Tolkien was no different. Tolkien left his unfinished work to his son, Christopher, 
who has gone on to publish numerous pieces of his father's and of his own. This is reminiscent of Bilbo, Frodo, and Sam. When Frodo met Bilbo in Rivendell, Bilbo said, quote, Don't adventures ever have an end? I suppose not. Someone else always has to carry on the story. Bilbo passes the unfinished book to Frodo, which works on it until his final departure. In The Return of the King, the narrator says, quote, In the next day or two, Frodo went through his papers and his writings with Sam, and he handed over his keys. In handing over his writings, Frodo is handing over his inheritance. He is asking Sam to continue carrying on the story. Frodo explains, quote, I have quite finished it, Sam. The last pages are for you. The poetic life of a story resonates with Tolkien's personal views. He passed his unfinished stories to his son, who has done his best to carry on the tale of the hobbits, and knowing this helps us see Tolkien's poetic nature more clearly. Tolkien's life story, unfortunately but inevitably, came to an end on September 2, 1973. Much like Frodo in The Return of the King, Tolkien imagined a peace following death. The narrator says, quote, The gray rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back, and he beheld white shores and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. The words silver glass, white shores, green country, and swift sunrise all bring a warm and welcoming tone into her hearts. Tolkien was 81 when he died. It's likely he knew his time was coming to an end, but that did not cause him heartache. Instead, he longed for the restful West in a poem that he wrote in 1966 called Bilbo's Last Song. He writes, Guided by the lonely star, beyond the utmost harbor bar, I'll find the heavens fair and free, and beaches of the starlit sea. Ship, my ship, I seek the west, and fields and mountains ever blessed. Farewell to Middle Earth at last, I see the star above my mast. Tolkien's life was riddled with loss, but his faith and his perseverance kept him optimistic and hopeful that all would end well. The last letter he ever wrote was to his daughter, Priscilla. The very last words read, quote, It is stuffy, sticky, and rainy here at present, but forecasts are more favorable. Tolkien was talking about the weather, but if he knew, then, that he would die four days later, his poetic soul may have still chosen to use the same words. Life is stuffy and sticky, and sometimes dreary, but Tolkien knew that forecasts are more favorable, if one's hope rests in heaven. Tolkien's faith in the most favorable outcomes led him through a lifetime of loss and turned his life into the ultimate fairy tale. J.R.R. Tolkien never gave up on his dream of writing an epic adult fairy tale. In chasing that desire, which took him nearly a dozen years, he ended up writing the unforgettable Lord of the Rings in memory of those he lost. All the while, he lived a life worthy of a fairy tale writer. He loved his family and friends deeply, so deep that his heart for them inspired characters, scenes, and outcomes in his majestic works. He took relationships, struggles, and triumphs that he had experienced and wrote them in a way that would make lasting impressions for generations to come. With the release of the recent motion picture about his life, it's evident that people still want more of his stories. And if Tolkien was here today, 
He may agree with Bilbo. The story must go on. And in fact, the adventure continues. Fabled was produced by me, Vanessa K. Eccles, with music by Kevin McLeod. Many thanks to Laurie for supporting the show through Patreon this week. I'm so humbled and grateful for your generosity. Did you know that for a monthly contribution of only a dollar, you can access bonus episodes and bonus content? If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash fablecollective. Be sure to check out the books and audiobooks section on the website, fablecollective.com, and snag your free copy of the audiobook of Love and Legend. And be sure to say hello on social media at Fable Collective. As always, thank you for listening. <laughs>